the memorial, a 45 minute discussion about why you should not eat the bread or drink the wine that they are about to pass out. I got a, I got a feeling this is gonna be the quickest 45 minutes ever. <laughs> I've never been this excited to go to a memorial. <laughs> you know, the memorial is definitely the most boring event of every event in the world of Jehovah's Witnesses. It is. For sure. It is. I always was just getting through it to go out to dinner. Yeah. That was that was the thing. But you look good, Jimmy. Thank you. But I, I got to say. I went old school. Old light. Old light. Old light. He's wearing a tie. No tie. Of course, I, even, I do have a jacket. I even got my book bag in the car. A book? You brought I a book I brought a book bag. Yes, I brought a book bag. And I got some stuff in that book bag that Ooh. might come out later. Apostate material. Absolutely. I like it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to get down there. I'm wearing a jacket, even though that's old light, because I need to put the camera in here. And my camera so that it won't be visible when I can right report here. Oh, okay, there we go. It's gonna go right there. Can y'all tell I got a camera on? <laughs> Not from here, I so, can't. No, no. Yeah, it looks kind of like a beeper, but that's like from the '80s. Yeah, and they shouldn't be looking down that way anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hot sisters, so you don't know. You don't know. These days, there's not a lot of brothers left in the. There order. isn't. Yeah, I'm just saying, but you're married, so absolutely. Yeah, so. All right. Okay, well, we're gonna go, and we'll pick up after this. What's up? How you doing? Hello, hello. Hey, hey, how you doing? Hey, good. All right, what's your name? John. John, I'm Ashley. Nice, nice to meet you. Hey, what's your name? How about that? Nice to meet you, Ashley. Oh, sorry, John. Yeah. Hey, how are you? 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 Hey, I don't see anybody. I see a distinct lack of beard. No, I see a beard. I see a beard back there. I see a couple of them. I see a couple of beards. Jimmy. Yeah. Jimmy. Nice Jimmy, to meet you. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you, nice to meet you Is this your first time here visiting us? Oh, I grew up in the religion, but I haven't been in a long time. I've been in Africa for about five years. And so, we're glad to have you yeah. with us. That's there's, there's been some changes that I'm like, yes. What in the world is going on? <laughs> One of the things as a kid I never really understood because we'd read all this literature with all the guys with the beards and Jesus with the beard, and then brothers weren't supposed to have beards, yeah. and that didn't really click. So, but that was cultural. What was the cultural thing about beards? Though? Just because beards have been like well, cool beards, for decades. So why is it well, now? Even if you look at the pictures of the brothers in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they had beards. Yeah, yeah. But that was a cultural thing. It was, it, it, it was appropriate for a man to have a beard. As time changed a little bit, especially getting into the 60s and 70s, Basically, the culture was that if you had a beard, you were suspicious. But it wasn't like that in the 90s and 2000s, though, so why did no, it take beards, so long? the beards started coming back. Well, Job's organization always makes sure of things scripturally. It's probably a little slow. Remember how fast the chariot in Ezekiel's vision moved? Like flashes of lightning. But the brothers scripturally came around to the point that, yeah, these brothers are right. So what was really the right scriptural right. reason for not doing it? The update where they explained it, uh, it's the um, 2024 update number one, mm -hmm. where they literally went through scripture by scripture and explained why it's okay. And they also went back to the history of it. They used to wear beards, they stopped wearing beards, and then beards started coming back. And it's more, really depends on that scripture about not stumbling the least of these. But now, it's been a long time yeah, since a beard has last, been considered undignified. 20 years or so, beards have gradually been coming yeah. back in public. And you've been seeing businessmen wearing them. College professors. You've been seeing politicians, yeah. professors. Yeah, yeah. So as beards have become more and more common again, the brothers realize, you know, really, this is an undue restriction. Why not just let an individual decide whether or not they think it's appropriate or not, rather than like yeah. setting restrictions well, on the Well, partially that's, that was one of the scriptures that they talked about uh, dressing with modesty and soundness of mind. And a grooming, of course, that applies to the same. And that soundness of mind means a person exercising their spiritual discernment, 
that yes, this is appropriate for me, and, and, and I feel like I'm not casting disparagement on Jehovah with my grooming or dress. I agree with that. Shouldn't Jeez, it that always have trend. been an individual's decision, though? It's not the governing body deciding. The governing body has decided. It's scriptural direction. And back Which in the 60s, like you said, decided it that? was more about uh, image of rebelliousness. It was chosen that we don't want to project the wrong image of being rebellious like this group of people, so they started shaving. If there wasn't a scriptural prohibition specifically for a beard, in oh, fact, Lord. if I remember, like in the Mosaic Law, you were but, supposed to have one. Remember, but hang on, just I don't, I don't want to forget what I'm, where I'm no, going. Okay. Shouldn't it always have been the individual brother's decision whether or not he had one? Why is it all of a sudden now people can decide for themselves? First of all, I'm not a governing body member, but uh, you know the decision at the time. They make all their decisions based on scripture. They're, the decisions are not, okay, we're, we're going to decide that they have to do this. The governing body has decided. If we've been promoting our own opinion on this subject, contradicting the guidance from the organization, have we been promoting unity? That's why when they came out with this update, they provided the scriptural reasoning why they used to not wear beards and the understanding that they come from, because the Lewis brothers, just like all of us, continue to learn God's Word and to continue to, you know, understand things better than they did before. And the understanding became exactly what you said. Let's let it be a brother's choice. Contradicting the guidance from the organization. And as long as he's dignified in the way he wears his beard, then it's not going to cast disparagement on Jehovah. And so you, you could say it was a correction. And, and it's good to know that Jehovah's organization can look at stuff and go, you know, we've been talking about this no beard thing for a long time, and maybe we're all right. Yeah. Maybe we should let these brothers decide for themselves. I'd rather be part of an organization that admits, you know, maybe we should look at our choice here. Maybe we weren't right. Then one that just pounds its foot and says, no, that's our rule. We're not changing it. We will never change our scriptural position on that subject. When there's scriptural discernment that said, maybe we were setting a standard we shouldn't set. The governing body, because of inquiries from all over the world about beards, examined their previous decisions and the scriptures and came to the conclusion that, hey, we're, we were wrong. So what you're saying is, they never really had the authority to disallow it. Well, and so authority. they decided that now no, they're they, going to stop like disallowing. Said, we all grow and learn in the scriptures. She never stopped learning. At the time, the understanding of the scriptures were that they didn't want to stumble the public because of the... You have to look at the gist of all, all those rebellious guys in the 60s, early 70s, they wore beards, so beards were seen as rebelliousness. It just feels like overreach if there's not a specific scriptural prohibition. And plus it's been, what, 50 years? It took a long time for them to come around. Like flashes of lightning. That's that update. It, that update number one, because they very humbly explain where wasn't there used to be beards, and now there wasn't, and now there are, and why. And they were very humble to point out that we grew in our understanding of the scriptures and realized we shouldn't have this prohibition. I noticed some pants, too. Yeah, I saw that, too. That's Dignified crazy. That Dignified slacks. You know, that and that's was real not allowed when I was not a kid. Yeah, this is totally yeah. different than when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. they're, but they're still very dignified. They look very young. Yeah, sure. You know, and we had pants suits. You, guys look great. you don't have a tie over there. You look nice. But no tie. <laughs> was there a scriptural reason for the pants? Sorry, it's trying to get Again, it comes back to. The governing body has decided. 
first of all, culturally. Okay. Um, and then secondly, the scripture that I was just talking about, where it talks about the older women teaching the younger women and to not be involved in, uh, to be modest in their dress right. and not to be involved in, back then hair braiding was a sign of, of paganism. And I'm talking about like braids, not a braid. Right. And so that scripture is written to remind the women to be modest in their dress. Are pants considered and, immodest? Since well, when? No, I mean, they, since I was a oh, kid. they wouldn't they, be wearing them. Well, no, I mean, like, even <laughs> since I was a little kid, pants were never seen as immodest, so why did it take so long? Like flashes of lightning. It's scriptural learning and understanding. It, it's hard because it's combined with what the world sees and what Jehovah sees and the scriptural reasoning of that. Well, I've and, been and in again, the world for... Quite some time, which I guess how I you would say 20, it. I spent 26 so, uh, years in the military. I, I never saw anyone think pants were immodest, so I guess I don't get why now. There are some to be immodest. Oh no, yeah, I mean I get, yeah, if they're tight. I but get it. No, yeah, I agree, for sure. And, and I think that's right. Look, the sisters were like, wow. So Jehovah has his organization. Keep up with the charity. Keep up with what's going on in the world and what's going on in their organization. And the fact that you can trust the sisters to dress dignified even though they wear pants. Well, I agree with that. It just says, you know, someone who's been out for a long time, it just feels like y'all caught up really slow to the way the standards are in the world. This is Deontay. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Say, now, he's got the beard. Yeah, it looks good. Oh, he, Jimmy, he shaved it off and then grew it back. This guy <laughs> yeah. looks good in the beard. Looks he good. So he was like, did you see the announcement? This was like a week after I shaved. Like a week after I shaved. Like a week after I shaved. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't see the announcement. He but said, go see the announcement and call me back. Did I ever say, Deontay, you have to shave? No, but okay. he didn't. He was a like, week got, later. That cracks me up. Yeah. But it looks yeah. good. Things have changed. Okay. Yeah. I can tell you that when I was in the military and I was kind of studying, uh -huh. it wasn't. And they continue to change too. The congregation I was in in Hawaii where I was studying were just they were like this. And then I went to Texas and went to a congregation there. I grew up in Texas. I was born. I walked out of the meeting and told my wife, if that's Jehovah's organization, I ain't never gonna be a Jehovah's organization. Have we been promoting unity? Things yeah. change. Yeah. And, and they grow and Jehovah helps us to grow and realize that hey you can do this. You can do this. Mm -hmm. And and Part of what they said was, we don't want to be the ones setting the rules. The governing body has decided, if we've been promoting our own opinion. They want it to come from Jehovah. Well, Jehovah said be modest. He didn't say you have to wear a skirt. Yeah, see, that, that was kind of my thing was like, well, it says be modest. It doesn't say no pants. It doesn't say no beards. It just says be modest. So yeah. shouldn't a mature person's conscience you, you dictate what that Paul, means. When Paul wrote that, he was addressing a congregation in the first century. A woman didn't wear pants in the first century. Well, yeah, nobody wore pants so, in the first and, century. <laughs> but he was addressing that then, so when he was talking about modesty, they all wore dresses. Yeah, it took a long time to get around to the pants. Like flashes of lightning. But a good change is always good change, even if it's a little slow. And I think, you know, just the sisters, they're so happy about the pants. Yeah, I saw a few of them. Yeah. I saw a few of them. They're, they're very good. happy. Look, I, I spent two years with no tie in service. I came back here and they're like, oh, you're going to wear a tie? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh growing up in Texas yeah. with the heat and the tie, and some of them, like the older brothers, oh. would still wear suit coats, and it's oh, 100 yeah. degrees I outside. Had news for you. In it was crazy. Here, you ain't gonna catch me in a coat. <laughs> Short sleeve. No Short coat. sleeve. You still gonna wear a tie out, sir? No, no. Yeah. I ain't wearing it now. Yeah. I went out last week. I wasn't wearing a tie. Awesome. I like that. Yeah. Mm. I like the same. No ties. It's good. Yeah, in Hawaii, it was weird over there. You were required to wear a tie for the meeting for service. So you would tuck an Aloha shirt in, <laughs> put a clip on tie on. Uh huh. And go to service. Go to the meeting service. As soon as you walk out, clip on tie off, throw it in the glove box, pull the shirt out. Yes. Man, that's crazy. I didn't know it was like that there. Because yeah. everywhere so I grew up, it wasn't anymore. like that at all. Have we been promoting unity?
Yeah. And, and Aloha shirts there, you have to understand, first of all, they're not the kind of shirts you see here. Yeah, that's they're true. much that's true. more yeah. just... I've been nice it's super the relaxed there. Yeah. They're, they're I don't mean the well made, church, but... And to them, culturally, that's a dress shirt. Right. You'll see bank presidents, politicians, lawyers. Yeah. You'll see a lawyer go to court and he's wearing an Aloha shirt. Mm -hmm. That's their dress attire. So it's no big deal for a witness to come to their door in an Aloha shirt. You look like you fit in the community. Yeah, sure. I so, get it. Speaking of service, I heard that they, the publishers don't have to report time anymore. No, wait, wait, what? Yeah, no, they're yeah. not. Publishers they're not. Don't, that's they don't have, have, have the little, if the little a, slip If thing? you're not a pioneer, the only thing you have to do is report that you participated in the ministry, and if you conducted a Bible study, the Bible study. You don't have to report your literature. You don't have to report X number of hours. What, what was the, the thing ministry. behind that? Because that was such the, a big deal. Yeah, when I mean, I, yeah, you were supposed I, to get like well, 20 hours I'm a pioneer. I'm a pioneer. That is, that is. I oh, okay, so you still time. do it. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. My wife and I have been pioneering for 18 years now. The decision was that the publisher's gift to Jehovah of the fruitage of the lips right. was what Jehovah asked for. Uh -huh. And he didn't ask for an accounting from them. Now, when the Levites volunteered to be a Levite and go to the temple and work, mm -hmm. they were promising to do something extra. That's like the pioneers. We're saying we want to do more. Huh. So it's more like a job for a pioneer no, no, no. and more it's, like a volunteer a for everybody else? It's a devotion to Jehovah. We've said we want to devote our life to service to Jehovah. But it seems strange to clock time when, like, you don't see that in the gospel. Like, Jesus didn't clock time, yeah. apostles didn't no, clock they, time. It, I mean, they obviously yeah. did this a lot, yeah. but you don't really but, know but how the, much other for people instance, did. The Levites, mm -hmm. we were talking about, yeah. during those times, there were certain things that ones would devote more of their life, like the Levites did. Okay. And in doing so, they did have accountabilities. Gotcha. Now, their accountabilities were different than the ones we had. So they did never that. did the time thing for any scriptural reason. And that's why they got no, rid of it? Yeah, no. You have to remember, too, the government says, well, what if the government comes out and says, okay, we're drafting again. You're all getting drafted. You can't claim to be a full-time minister and have no documentation to prove it. Oh, so that's... Is that sure, part? That's, that's, that's is one that reason. part of the purpose. Yeah. For the, oh, it's actually going only the, the pioneer Supreme thing. At one time, or is it just the checkbox thing too? Anybody, because they can show a record and say, no, no, look, they're a devoted servant of Jehovah. They go out and service every month. They conduct Bible studies. That makes them a minister. Gotcha. So that's now we have, so a, I didn't we know have grounds I didn't for, for legal purposes Jehovah too. Jehovah protects okay. his people. I gotcha. And that's what you know. That's one of the reasons that's so important. And. and in the near future could be very important. What, do you think we're going to war? I hope not, but look at the world around us. We could. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying, look at the world. I mean, gotcha. you know. It's it, definitely it, a crazy world out there. Everything <laughs> going on in the Middle East, Ukraine, China, and Taiwan. That, you know what's interesting about all that? I read a book by it's Dr. Nice. Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature, mm -hmm. and it shows how violence has actually greatly decreased. In the 15th century, a man had a one in five chance of being bludgeoned or stabbed to death. And today, that chance is less than one tenth of one percent. Mm -hmm. So, while maybe today compared the, to 10 years wars. ago, it's yes. worse. But yeah. today, compared to the 15th century, we're way safer You'd love than to we hear used a talk to be. I do on safety in a dangerous world. You wouldn't believe the FBI statistics. I'm a criminal justice major, and, and so, so I is it worse than one in five oh, yeah. stabbed or bludgeoned to death? Yeah. In the world today? In, no, in the United States. More than one out of five men are stabbed or shot to death? We got to sit down. Okay, right. I got to get on Thanks for talking to us. Appreciate no, no, no. it. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. I just, uh, you know, even though I was an actor for so long, my, uh, my mom and dad, for some reason, they still don't talk to me. And that kind of sucks. I, you know, I haven't been disfellowshipped or, you know, whatever. But yeah, that's what I mean. That's changed. They, they don't talk to me. And, yeah, you know, I thought if you were disfellowshipped, right. then you don't get talked to. But sometimes folks are uh, overreact, you know. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know. 
Yeah, that's what it is. That's not the counsel we give it. Well, everybody, that was the first segment of many to come of Jimmy and I going to the memorial. Now, a lot of people have asked us, why would you go to the memorial? And some people, the minority, got a little heated about it. But the reason being is that we wanted to demonstrate to people what it's actually like, how unreasonable the people can be in their indoctrination. And I actually got very lucky that when we went in, the guy that who I'm talking to, he's an elder, but he's also the person who's giving the memorial talk that evening. I did not know that when I walked in, then, so that was just lucky. And Jimmy also started talking to an elder. We didn't know that at first. No. And later on, he asks him to verify, are you an elder? And he says he is. So we know that we both we're fortunate enough to have a conversation with an elder. So, and you'll see, and you can probably already see the indoctrination from the things that the elder I was talking to and what he's saying. And notice he did not and will not through the entire video quote a scripture to us or to me or to Jimmy, and neither does Jimmy's elder. Mm -hmm to prove the things that we ask them about. Now, of course, on stage, the brother gives the standard memorial script thing and reads some scriptures or whatever. But when we are asking questions and making logical uh, contradictions to what they're saying, he does not read or quote scripture. So that's important to keep in mind. Now, I can't show their faces, which is why it's all blurred. But there's a reason for that. That's for legal requirements here. We're, we live in North Carolina, so I'm keeping all the faces out. But the important thing is not the face because the video where it, it's in our pocket and it's moving around and stuff. The face isn't important. It's the words. Pay attention to the words. And so he never quotes a scripture. He admits that beards have been totally fine in the culture for at least 20 years and a bunch of other things that we'll discuss but first I wanted to get laurel's opinion because she went to the memorial in mexico i just gonna say um that it was it was a spanish congregation and the spanish people down here have not woken up not like the english people are they're they're still it, it's a very religious country very catholic so it, it was packed. There wasn't an empty seat. But my first, what really shocked me, because it's been a long time since I've been, is not one Bible. The only person in the whole place that had a Bible was the elder that was giving the talk. There wasn't one songbook. Nobody carried bags anymore. I I mean, there 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 was, there was none of that. And I... I thought if I took any of my friends that are religious, if I took them into the memorial, they would be completely shocked that nobody has a Bible because all churches have Bibles. It, it, it's, it's the most important thing you should be carrying in your hand. I laugh only because I carried a book bag into the memorial you're so old, like with me. with a Bible and a songbook. I actually forgot they put the songs. Yeah, they up put on the, the songs thing. on the screen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I went old school. Yeah. So then there's that, and at most of the churches, actually, all the churches I've been to, I've been to a lot of them. Uh, they always have Bibles right on, in front of you. Yeah, in the pew. Yeah, it, in front of you to pull and use if you don't happen to have one or don't want to bring one or whatever. But there's nothing like that. At a kingdom hall, there are no Bibles there for people to just pick up and use. And I, that's very interesting. Can, this kingdom hall, it was pretty full. About 200 people, I heard him say. 206. 206. Yeah, so that's pretty good for a, a kingdom hall in the States to have that many people. And you would think with that many people and obviously a lot of visitors there <laughs> because I saw a lot of people per day. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that was visitors. Uh that they would have had Bibles and things for people, but they don't. They don't hand those out. There's, I mean, I guess if you ask for one, they could probably give you one. But you would think they would just be there so you could follow along in the scriptures, but they're not. Now, a couple of things we go to go back to the beginning to the intro of the video. I am not that short, folks. <laughs> I don't yes, know what you are. I'm five eight. <laughs> he looks like he's fifty-five or something. I don't know. It's. I really think <laughs> I am six one and Jimmy's five eight, so I'm about five inches taller than him. But the 
angle. I think it's the angle of the camera because <laughs> we're standing on pavement. And I really think it's because it's going downhill a little bit. I was in a hole. It looks like Jimmy's so much shorter than he really is. So no, no, no. He just, is the, not just the and fact that not you're bringing... Yeah, just the fact that you're bringing it up, you're telling me you got short man syndrome. I well, that's only because people were asking. People were asking. We had, we had, asking. We had to clarify. <laughs> we have new understanding on the height of the brothers. Okay, so let's go through the things that the elder says, and we won't take a lot of time no. because we just want to show you mostly what's going on and have you draw your own conclusions. But a few highlights to point out. First of all, the elder admits that beards have been fine for at least 20 years. So why did it take them so long for it to be okay? And the truth is that no one in, from the 90s, when I was in high school in the early to mid 90s, nobody looked down on a well-kept beard in that time. He talks about the 60s and the 70s, 50 years prior or 60 years prior. As if that's justification to keep beards prohibited because it was a prohibition for 60 years. But that doesn't explain why it was prohibited it in the 30s, the exactly. 40s, and the 50s. Exactly. And we know, of course, as XJWs, why beards were actually prohibited. It has nothing to do with the cultural BS that he talks about. And the Watchtower used to use that line, too. It's because uh, Charles Taze Russell, the first president of the Watchtower, had a big beard. And when Rutherford took over, started making a lot of changes to the doctrines, a lot of the brothers didn't like that. And they kept the beards to show their support of Russell, whereas Rutherford was clean shaven. So he instituted the no beard policy to try to make people get away from everything that resembled Russell at all. And then they started that line and they used to try to say that Jesus didn't have a beard. They used to try to show in the old publications that Jesus was clean shaven. When Jewish law would have forbade Jesus as a Jew, from being clean shaven. And so that, of course, didn't fly either. And they finally gave up on that and started showing him and the Jews as having beards again in all of their publications. But he doesn't cite a single scriptural reason for why it was prohibited or why suddenly it changed. We know why it changed. People are leaving. It's a very strict, harsh religion. It's stark. Nobody wants to look like they look the, in the kind of clothes that they wear. So they changed it to try to hold on to people. That's what this is really about. Now, that's my opinion because I haven't talked to the GB to find out what they're really thinking, but it seems obvious to me. What do you guys think? Well, I've got an opinion on that. Did you say that in, in the state, like where you live, that it was okay in the 90s to have a beard? No, no, no. Overall, as a, yeah, culturally, yeah. as a society, it wasn't bad. Oh, as a society, yeah, yeah. because um, my brother, who was an elder, he had, um, as a matter of fact, the last time I talked to him, he won't talk to me anymore, but the last time I talked to him, see, he grew up with very bad acne, and he had pock marks all over his face. And he's high up in the congregation and he just had to step down from being an elder because of his nerves and so on. But he wanted, he wanted nothing more than to grow a beard because he's a nice looking guy. And he says, if I grew a beard, it would hide all this. And he says, I just, I said, then why don't you grow a beard? And him at that time as an elder said to me, because it's a man-made rule. So mm -hmm. they know it is. They know what it is. <laughs> that is absolutely true. I look at it as more as Watchtower using this as a control mechanism. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back to Rutherford, the story was that when he was in Germany visiting the branch over there, the branch overseer wanted a printing press. And Rutherford allegedly had told this guy, uh, well, you get rid of that, pointing to his beard, and you'll have your printing press. And so the next day, the guy came in and he was clean shaven. Germany got the printing press. Yeah. And if you think about it, for those that have experience with Watchtower in the past, if you started studying, uh, have a Bible study with Jehovah's Witnesses, your study conductor, if you had a beard, 
would highly recommend that you shave your beard. Um, they try to say that, you know, they couldn't have a beard because they didn't want that image of rebelliousness. Uh, but it was it was a restriction put on people used to control them. Yeah. And so, I mean, you couldn't have a part in a meeting if you had a beard or any type of facial hair except a mustache. But, yeah, I, I look at it as just control. Yeah. Complete control. That's what it is. And he, the is. elder does admit that it should be an individual's choice. But later he contradicts that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he says it should be, then he says it shouldn't be. And this, this will happen a lot. There's a lot of contradictions that are going to happen in these com conversations. But also pay attention to how nice he's being right now, because that also changes. He gets very judgmental towards the end, and you'll see that. In fact, at the end, I have to edit the video way more. Whereas here, it's easy to just let him freely speak. He's calm. He's being nice. Towards the end, he gets very flustered and starts repeating himself over and over and over again. And it's very painful to watch it. So I edit it just to my argument, his argument, my argument, his argument. So you'll see a lot more cuts at the end. Otherwise, it was it's just impossible to watch it. And the point isn't that that he gets flustered. That's not important. The important thing is what is he saying? What claims are he making? And can you back that up? And you guys can make your decision on that as we go. Well, I think the next part we get into on that the first part of the video was, well, they gave the brothers a perk by allowing them to have beards. Yeah. Now the sisters had to get their perk too. So we go into the sisters of being yeah. allowed to wear pants, yeah. which you did see in the video. Mm -hmm. uh, we did spot a couple of those. But again, no scriptural no script. reference. Even the governing body on their update, number two, not number one, like he said, there was no scriptural reference to why they were allowing that to happen. It literally was just them saying the governing body has decided and here's what they decided no references no scriptures no nothing that's it and i asked the elder I, I told him well since i was a kid pants have never been considered immodest why did it take you so long and i keep cutting in that clip it, it's humorous but it's also for a point where uh stephen led is talking about how god's chariot is like flashes of lightning these changes happen fast quickly you got to keep up with your host chariot and yet they were so slow they lagged so far behind the rest of the culture in the country with these doctrinal changes, because they are doctrinal changes about what people can and cannot do for their own appearance in oh. the kingdom home and being a uh, Jehovah's Witness in good standing. Laurel? Yeah, I just had a comment on that. I remember this, I'm way older than you guys, but I remember in the 90s, my husband, he was never an elder or a ministerial servant, but he... I had always wanted him to grow a beard and I was away for a couple of weeks and I came home and he surprised me and he looked so good. He looked so good looking with his beard and everything. And all he was allowed to do at that time was give, you know, the theocratic ministry school talks. He was allowed to read the Bible or whatever. He had no privileges, nothing, but he got told that if you don't get rid of that beard, no more talks for you. Absolutely nothing. So, yeah. They, so my question to that was, and they, they didn't like, they didn't like me speaking up. <laughs> and I said, well, you, you don't allow a beard, but what about white supremacist who started the bald head movement? You know, when people completely shave their heads, if you look back on that, that goes back to white supremacy. So it, why was that never stopped? Like, what, you know, like the, the two to me go together. They, they're, they're, they're picking and choosing what they're going to allow from their governing body and what they're not going to allow. And none of it has anything to do with the Bible. Yeah, yep. they've always cherry picked what they enforced and what they didn't. And it's very sad when he talks about how excited the sisters are to get to wear pants. When I heard him say that, it made me think of Stockholm Syndrome, mm -hmm. where your captor, you feel grateful to your captor when he or she gives you some little thing back as if you shouldn't have had all that and far more all along. So you, to see the witnesses get excited about being given a privilege to choose what they wear and whether or not they have a beard 
just emphasizes yeah. how much control the religion has over every little aspect of their lives. They're grateful for something they should have been mad about them prohibiting to begin with. And mm -hmm. yet that's Stockholm syndrome. So the question, the question everybody should be asking is how in the world did these people get so indoctrinated? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. For sure. There's a lot to that. All right. Well, then he gets into uh, time cards. <laughs> and that was interesting. It was interesting. I had never heard anyone. I haven't read anything where the Watchtower is having them check a box and report time for the sake of being able to claim that basically to avoid the draft is what he was getting at. That if mm -hmm. the country goes to war, you can claim you're a minister because you clock time every month. That was interesting to me. Yeah, I had never heard that before. And it just makes me wonder, you know, we're, that we're not going to get in any political discussion right. here at all. Because that's not the, the platform here today. But he's talking about the state of the world. I think it's a little later in the video. We'll get mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. But, um, you know, if they think the world is so bad and there's going to be a war, why wouldn't they keep doing their time if he's going to use that as the explanation? Yeah. It didn't make a lot it of doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And then he says that he was a criminal justice major, which I'm sure. Okay, I'm sure. But he cites a statistic. He says from the FBI, I think. That the murder rate in the United States is worse than 20%? Yeah, that's... I'm like, that's just ridiculous. You don't know... And I show a chart in the video. As you I saw love that. your chart. Good yeah. idea. <laughs> the murder rate is less than... Uh, it's like 0.1%. It's one in... It's a tiny fraction of his claim, according to the actual data in the chart. So that just tells me that he's so indoctrinated to think that the world is so evil and dangerous that more than one in five people are murdered in the United States. And that's just, it's just, wow, that surprised me, especially coming from a guy who claims to have a criminal justice background. Well, it's also too, he's promoting fear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. so we have control and we have fear. Oh, really? Really? No, no way. <laughs> yeah. And before we get into the next segment, the last thing is Jimmy's talking to the elder and the elder says that his family is overreacting to Jimmy being inactive. <laughs> and, but when Jimmy stopped and his mom refused to talk to him anymore, that that's what they're told to do. It's mm -hmm. in the watchtower and I'll show it over the screen here. No texts, no emails, no conversations, no phone calls. They had a video, and I'll cut that in, too, where the, the daughter who's disfellowship tries to call, mm -hmm. and the mom refuses to pick up the phone. And I'll show that. Uh, I actually, I'll show that later, because he actually says disfellowship people should be able to sit down and share a meal with their family. Yeah. But we're getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves. Bottom line is they contradict the Watchtower and each other and themselves repeatedly. So this next segment is the actual talk. It's only a couple of minutes of it, though. No point going through the whole thing. Just no. some pertinent points. And where, of course, Jimmy and I partake. Uh, your attendance, you've shown that you appreciate the Jesus Christ did from 2,000 years ago. And, of course, uh, we do this every year. It's the most important meeting of the year. And that Jesus Christ himself commanded that we do this in remembrance of him. So we're here for a solemn occasion in a way, but it's also a glorious opportunity to rejoice. To rejoice in the love that Jehovah and His Son, Jesus Christ, gave to each of us here tonight and all over the world that serve him. They will meet in kingdom halls, just like this one here. Assembly halls, which are larger, even in private homes, in rented facilities, in prisons, such as in Russia and Eritrea, or in open fields where no facility is available. Why do they do this? They want to obey that command that Jesus gave out of their love for his sacrifice. Even in countries where our work is banned, appreciative ones like you will risk their very freedom 
to obey this command from Jesus Christ. Last year, 20,461,767 people attended the memorial like we're having tonight. 20 million people. So then the question is, if we all have inherited this disease of sin and death, could right-hearted descendants of Adam ever be rescued from this? The answer is yes. They could. By means of the two greatest acts of love ever done by anyone. The first one at John 3.16, a scripture familiar to people all over the world, says, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed, but have everlasting life. So Jehovah willingly sent his firstborn son. Now let's stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus was his first creation. So not just his son. He was his first creation of all history, of all time. Jesus was the first creation. And Jehovah allowed his son to come to earth as a perfect man. Now in Matthew 20, 28, Jesus, speaking to his apostles, said, Just as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, so not like some ministers who have fancy clothes and high titles, Jesus said, No, I'm not here to have people bow down to me. I'm here to minister and to give life as a ransom in exchange for me. But well, you might ask, why did Jesus have to die? Why him? 1 Peter 2.22 says he committed no sin. Deception wasn't even found in his mouth. So he never even whispered a lie. He never told him a half-truth. The nature of the relationship then of a disfellowship person is not completely shunned. Normal family relations continue with the exception of spiritual fellowship. So I can think about this just for a moment. How many governments do you know where every single person in the world, in that country runs the government? Be kind of chaotic with it, with all those different ideas and opinions, it would be chaos. So Jehovah's Kingdom is like those governments. It has that limited number that participate in that government. So we can all decide whether to become a member of God's family of worshipers. But we cannot choose where we will serve him in heaven or earth. A person cannot decide to be born. When you were an embryo, you didn't say, okay, I'm going to be born this is the day I'm going to be born. Silly. The same applies to being born again. A careful reading of Jesus' words at John 3, 5-8, shows that Jesus did not teach that it is up to man to choose whether or not he is born again. You might ask the question, how do they know? How do the anointed know if they're anointed or not, if they're going to heaven? Turn with me to Romans 8, 15 to 17. Here, Paul writing to the congregation of Rome says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery, causing fear again. But you received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. This is a term of endearment. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So then, Jehovah's spirit operates on this individual, and they know that they are of the anointed. Faithful ones on earth will no longer observe the memorial upon Jesus' return. So you might sit here and say, but when's that? Well, first of all, no one knows. Jehovah, Jesus was 
endeared to say to his disciples, no one knows, not even the Son knows, but only the Father. As the plate of unleavened bread is passed among you, you might consider that Jesus offered a prayer just like we have and pass this bread to his 11 apostles. Christians down to this day hold this special event annually and are interested in the significance of the bread and the wine. As the wine is passed among you, consider the fact that Jesus spoke of his blood on Passover night. He could have called to mind the lamb's blood in Egypt. Okay, so first of all, Jimmy was lip syncing. He was not actually singing <laughs> the song. But I had to play my part. I had to play my part. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> I had to cut that little piece of that. I wasn't going to subject you to the whole song, but I had to cut that piece of that Jimmy. Lip made me laugh. I thought, what? Yeah, I just had to, you know, just to make it look good. Well, like they used to say back when I was in, you should sing full throated. Well, Jimmy's mouth was open wide, but nothing was coming out. Yeah. <laughs> And we're not going to spend a lot of time on the talk because the, the stuff that I cut in there speaks for itself for the most part. But there's a few things that just should be we'll say, laid out. We'll say before you do that, this talk, this outline is the same one all around the world yeah. in every memorial. Yeah. So, yeah, they have to stick to it. First of all, he talks about love. And that's when I cut in how Watchtower demands Jehovah's Witnesses shun. And you saw that reference from their own publications. And then later, they put that lying attorney at the Supreme Court in Canada who says that's not what they do. But it says right there in the publication, you saw exactly how they shun people. So that's important. Um, and Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses act as if the witnesses are so unique and the stuff that they do. He's like, people are risking their freedom to come to the memorial here. I'm like, do you know how many churches send people to China and other countries that are very unfavorable to Christianity generally? Mm -hmm. Far more than just witnesses do. So it's not, they're not special in that way. So they act like they're special and unique, but they're not. He's talking about, we have 20 million people here today, but there are two and a half, almost billion Christians, the vast majority of whom actually partake of the emblems, as you saw yeah. Jimmy and I do, which is what it says in the Bible to do. So they try to act like they're so special. Like, oh, we don't use high titles. What do you call governing body? That's a high title. So there's a lot of problems I have with that. And he talks about how Jesus... It, what he's done to save mankind, but in their own publications, in the Prince of Peace book, which I show, they clearly say Jesus is not your mediator unless yes. you're one of the anointed. So unless you're drinking the wine and eating the bread, he's not your mediator. So if you want to be a Christian, you better drink the wine and eat the bread. Otherwise, Jesus is not the intercessor for you to God through his sacrifice. They say it clearly in their own publications. Anybody have any thoughts on any of that so far? Go ahead, Laurel. Yeah, I was just going to say it, it hasn't changed ever since ever since I was a kid. It, it's not a celebration. It is a funeral. They, every year they have a funeral. It's They're not celebrating the fact that Christ came back and was resurrected and gave his life for all mankind so that all mankind can have hope for the future. All it, it somber and it's like going it's like going to somebody it, it's it's being at jesus death and they talked nothing i mean i was at spanish so how do i know <laughs> but but from what i remember they they really don't talk much but his resurrection it's all about the death and everything that happened around his death it's almost it's almost like like they're happy that he died or something yeah, I think one point I took away from that was when he started talking about God's government and that there's got to be a specific number of people ruling in this government. Uh, they've also said many times that they they don't look up to men, but like he said, with fancy clothes right, and all that, right, you know, right. we shouldn't do that. But what do the, what do the witnesses do with the governing body? Whenever a <laughs> governing body member goes to a assembly or a convention, Oh, this dude is surrounded like pop. It's like paparazzi around him. 
don't tell me they don't look up to the members of the governing body. And it so, and, oh, and fancy clothes. You remember Samuel Hurd's Rolex? Yeah. Which, based on someone looked it up and tried to find it, I think at the time it was a $30,000 watch. Whether it was a gift or not does not matter. The fact that he's wearing this high clothes, expensive stuff, and this elder is here saying, we don't do that. But yeah, your leaders do that. Yes, they do. And Laura, what did you say? Got, they got autographs? No, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, I saw that. There was a, they had a video of it at an assembly where people were handing them their Bible to get their autographs on the Bibles. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, unless you're an idol or a star or something, you're not giving your autograph to people because people wouldn't care. Yeah. And he it, it just kept <laughs> pointing out that, you know, mankind needs God's government and there's just going to be a certain number of people ruling. Um, and I guess my takeaway from that was you people, you serfs are just not smart enough to rule yourselves. Yeah, that's exactly. kind of what I took from that. He's arguing for a totalitarian system. That's what mm -hmm. he's doing, which is why I show the definition of democracy while he's saying, oh, you could never have a government where people make their own decisions. That would be chaotic if everyone had a voice. No, that's democracy. That's a better, it's not perfect. And one of my favorite quotes is, uh, <laughs> democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Like there, there's no <laughs> perfect form of government, but keeping people included in decision-making, at least as an ideal, is a very good, positive thing to do. And he is completely arguing against that. Yep. Now, this should be totalitarian. You only need these rulers telling you what to do and nothing else. And yeah, that's how the watchtowers run. The governing body is the rulers yep. and everyone else has to do what they say or else you're an apostate and you get kicked out and shunned. So they do live by those words. I mean, they're not being hypocritical there. They do actually enforce that kind of environment in their own culture. Oral and I have a lot to say about that subject on the big picture episode. <laughs> so if you haven't seen those, go check that out because this all ties into that. Yeah. So anyway. And then he says, how do the anointed know? And he reads the scripture in Romans, but he doesn't really give any kind of concrete answer to that. Based on what he read and what he says, anyone in the audience could believe sincerely that they are of the anointed. And if they believe that, they absolutely should eat the bread and drink the wine. But he discourages people from doing that, saying that effectively saying you're not one of those people. And I didn't show the whole talk because it's it's boring. Just, it's boring and long. But if you ever go to a memorial and listen to the full talk, it really is, like I said at the beginning, it's 45 minutes of him con trying to convince you not to partake of the emblems that they're about to pass. That's really what it is. And that's why some people call it a black menace because it's the rejection of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So to be fair, if you actually look up what a black mass is, it's way worse than what the Watchtower does. But they definitely do reject the emblems. And I just don't see that as any way jibing with Christianity at all. Well, then he also said that, you know, after Jesus's return, there would be no more need for a memorial. Well, according to Watchtower Doctrine, didn't Jesus return in 1914? That's right. That's right. So why do they still celebrate this if he came back in 1914? That's right. Now, another thing you could do if you wanted to, if you wanted to just upload the talk just by itself. Yeah, that's true. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. You could just upload the talk. Yeah. If somebody wants to watch it, yeah. they could. Okay. Yeah, I'll think about doing that and making it available for people if you really want to see. Or I could just put a link to the talk in the video description one way or the other if you want to watch the whole thing we can make it available yeah we're now i have to be blurred out too of course <laughs> i zoned out through that whole thing while yeah. we were there yeah i was like oh it's just another watchtower talk. watching it <laughs> I guess. all right well now after it's over and no more music or jimmy singing don't worry about that no uh we're going to get back into the next conversations that jimmy and i have so let's get into the first one which is where i start talking to the speaker again and he gets way more flustered and judgmental so here you go yeah, I really appreciate you yeah, I, I have a question i know he said we have to get out of here fast. Oh, no, I, in 10 or 15 oh minutes. okay when, i've never really understood this when you read in revelation 14 yes the 144,000. uh is that 
you guys think all the stuff around it is all symbolic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why but, is the number literal if everything else is symbolic? Well, you notice it's a specific number. It did, like when it spoke to the people that are going to be on earth, it says a great crowd. That's symbolic because there is no number. This but is, is the lamb a literal lamb? The lamb is the lamb of Christ. Symbolic. Christ was given. It Mount Zion? That word represents him. Mount Zion is not a literal mountain. Jehovah, Jehovah's spiritual mountain. Symbolic. Yes, and actually, in, in Mark on the forehead, it, the symbolic, symbolic meaning they have been represented by Jehovah. The so, singers, the throne, the creatures, like all that symbolic. We so why have, is this? We actually literal. have an entire study book. This is a really the simple number, question. Yeah. If the everything else is, is symbolic, specific. why the is it the number? Notice Mount Zion is not a specific. Yeah, it's symbolic. Mount. But it's not specific. 144,000 is an exact number. Okay, 666, that's specific, but that's symbolic, isn't that's it? That's the number, that's man's number. It's okay. a specific number. It's a specific number. But it's symbolic. Just like, what does seven represent? Completeness. So it's a symbolic number. Yeah, so if 666 is specific it's and number. symbolic, this specific number is also symbolic of something in the same way 666, a specific number, is also symbolic of something. I understand what you're saying. You get what I'm saying? The, the, the reference, though, is is there anywhere else in the Bible where that number is used as a symbolic representation? Is 666 used anywhere else as a no. symbolic representation? No. So wouldn't it make sense that 144,000 would symbolically represent what's those who have his name? What's the address of this building? I don't know. Yeah. Is this or does that number represent the location? It represents the location. But it's, it's a specific number to this location. I understand what you're saying, you Mark, me? right? That, yes. I understand and, what you're saying, but the same thing here you're saying is symbolic, even though it's specific. But you're saying this one is not symbolic because it's specific. It's not symbolic because it's specific in the context of the scripture. Just like 666 is actually specific. It's specific to mankind. Right. It symbolizes is mankind. specific to the anointed. So it symbolizes what? That's what I'm trying the to The number of anointed. Okay, so it's symbolic, just like 666. To the number of anointed, yes. And the only other thing I, that I have to completely disagree with, because again, it's been a long time, is Jehovah loves when the bread and wine passed. is passed, yes. you kept saying that that Jesus' sacrifice benefited everyone in the audience and everyone in the world. Whatever. Hang on, hang on, don't let me finish. To let the bread and wine pass by me would be to reject the blood and body of Jesus Christ because Jesus did not say, some of you keep doing this in remembrance of me, but not the others well, of you. Who he, did he give he, the command to? He gave it to the apostles in the His gospel disciples. that we all read right. as Christians. His disciples that yeah. he made a covenant with for a heavenly kingdom. And didn't Paul repeat that? To yes. keep doing it, which right. you read. And he didn't say that to only a few people. He didn't actually, say, now only a few of you are going to do this. You need to read context again, and it, it requires study. Paul was speaking to the anointed Christians of Corinth. He was speaking to all Christians. No, that letter was written to the congregation in Corinth to the anointed in that congregation. Everyone in that congregation. Not necessarily. We can't sit and say they were all anointed. We don't know. But we know but the he letter wrote, was He didn't say, us. those of you who are anointed take this. But time. he's writing to his brothers, and he used the yeah, word brothers, his brothers several times. Well, so you're context, saying that didn't mean any of the women? No. Just because he said brothers. He said. So yeah, brothers, clearly he meant everybody. Time, the term brothers he was using in that context were the anointed ones that he was well, a he brother with. He doesn't say that. He's talking to the whole you, congregation. You, you have to understand the context of it. And I know you've studied well, the Bible. The bottom line for me is when the bread and wine comes in front of me, mm -hmm. for me to not partake of it would be to reject the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which he told everyone to keep doing. And Paul told the 
the whole congregation to keep doing study with you you can't call yourself a Christian if you don't if you were rejecting the emblems that he told us to keep remembering but you're not taking it you're not of that group that he made that covenant well you don't know that yes I do know that. how do you know that I'm not of that group well for one thing you'd still be serving Jehovah oh so you think that because I'm not one of you no I cannot be because acceptable not, to God. You're not serving Jehovah God in the manner He approves. Well, how do you know that? How do I know it? You because I'm not yourself. sitting in the kingdom hall with you. How long has it been since you've been to a memorial? It's been a while because you guys reject the emblems. So in your case, you've rejected the emblems because you refuse to go to a memorial. Oh, I've gone to other churches, Mark. How long has it been since you've been to a memorial? Since you've observed the death of Christ the way Jesus said to observe it. You mean by eating the bread and drinking no, the wine? I've done that many times. The way he said I eat the bread and drink the wine, which is what he said to do. It doesn't matter if I'm going to heaven or staying on earth. But he If I appreciate Jesus' sacrifice, I show that by doing this in remembrance of him. And that Jesus Christ himself commanded that we do this in remembrance of him. Wherever I'm at, if I take the wine and eat the bread, whatever church I'm in, as long as my heart is right with God, I don't have to do things the way you but think. But that's not what Jehovah said. And no, let me ask no, you, that's what the government ever body heard, said. You, no, I don't agree with everything I, I, they I teach. I strictly by God's word. I could care less what those I don't say. agree. If we've been promoting our own opinion, the shunning I rule, I don't agree me, with the rejection of the emblems. Have you ever heard a church have any kind of theocratic doctrine that's in opposition to God's Word? Ever. In any church. Yeah, you guys have this no, one. No, no. I don't want to argue with all day. No, that's no, not no. why I asked you the question. It's never an argument. <laughs> that's we're, not what I wanted to do. We're discussing God's Word. That's never an argument. Jesus said, where two or more you gather together in my name, I will. Oh, so now I yeah. am acceptable because you're, we're gathered you're together. You're having a Christian discussion about God's Word, so that makes us Okay, so now you're confusing me because earlier you said I'm not serving God properly, and now you're saying I'm, if two I'm of you are gathered in my name, Jesus I'm fine. Asked, Perhaps God Himself will help you open your heart reading the Scriptures. Well, I think He already has, well, and that's, that's why I'm that's not wonderful. here anymore, because well, I just don't agree with some of the things you guys do. Does the, the way you attend to anything that you just you would disagree with, like celebrate Christmas and Easter and well, I'll tell you fly what an American flag? I'll tell you what they don't do. They don't shun children who make some mistake, and they we don't... We don't either. They don't... Yes, you do. They're not keeping up with the chariot. We don't. Oh, so you, th God changed his mind about that? No, then. God never changed his mind. Well, then it we was a man-made doctrine. Then. No, we understood his direction better. And so you got it wrong. Is, no. What if he just doesn't want to be on one of you guys anymore? They can do that. No, they can't. You'll yes, shun them. No, you know not we have I know way too many baptized. people to know that's not true. You guys shun people, They've been and I'm not okay with too. that. I'm I just studied not okay with a man that. that was gone for 30 years, and you know what he found out? Hmm. There was more to this than I understood. Well, I guess if your religion has changed so much since I've been gone, well, that's enough to Nobody tell me that it changed it's... so much. Things have changed. Okay. Yeah. God's word is still the basis of our. our I keep beliefs. asking you about things. You're like, oh, well, that's changed now. This is no, changed now. Our that's a lot of change our for having the forward. truth. If it wasn't the truth yesterday, how is it the truth change today? Scripturally, pa wearing pants is not a scriptural issue. Well, then why was it forbidden? That's focusing way too much on it. It wasn't forbidden. The understanding was to be modest. Uh, okay, and so at the time, so a sister could have worn pants and given a part before, and that was okay. No. A brother can't go up on stage and not wear a tie because it's not dignified. Not because the Bible says don't do it. So you don't We're think I would be dignified, even though I'm not wearing a tie? You're not on stage. But if I was, you're then saying you not having a tie is in order to be respectful of Jehovah God and His arrangement. See, that's a change too. You told me earlier I look fine. You look great. So why, how does a tie suddenly make stage. somebody worthy of being on stage? It's not a matter of being worthy to be on stage. None of us are worthy to represent Jehovah. He allows us to. It's considered appropriate for what you're doing. By who? 
by everybody in the congregation, the culture. What about us? But you, the culture would, wouldn't care if you didn't have a tie. Are we to be respectful to Jehovah? Well, yeah, sure. But Jesus didn't wear a tie, so there's nothing specific because about a tie. no one wore a tie there. Yeah, sure. You said that the community in Hawaii did not see a lack of a tie as disrespectful. And, okay. Not giving a part of the state. Had, did other churches always have people with a tie? I don't care what other churches do. But isn't it about what the community thinks is respectful or disrespectful? Because there's no scripture that says you have to wear a tie. This attire is what is considered in this community to be respectful, to be on stage and conduct. In the congregation, but not the community, because the community doesn't care if you wear a tie. Like you said, politicians and other religious leaders, they don't wear ties, and no one thinks that's no, disrespectful. No, but look around, religious leaders wear all kinds of fancy clothes that cost a bloody fortune. Who said well, not all of them. I've been to a lot of small the, churches that don't do that. Who said the Pope has to wear that big fancy gown? No, oh, I totally agree with you there. You got, I'm 100% with you there. My problem is no, you can't. No, there's not a Bible you scripture that says yeah, wear a tie. Yeah, there's not a scripture. If I wear a tie because I feel it's appropriate for what I'm doing. And it's your choice to do that, right? Your conscience, your desire to be respectful wants you to do that. But what if someone does not see that as a problem? That's between that brother and Jehovah God. Well, I agree but he completely. Come on stage like that simply because because a man it's not made a rule that says you have to wear a tie. Well, I got to say that was a very frustrating conversation, but you saw how his demeanor changed once I started to disagree with him about doctrinal things. Now, to be fair, I'm a very direct person, and I understand that when I get adamant about things I talk about, so I'll cut him some slack on some of that for sure. Uh, but he got really frustrated, mm -hmm. again, failed to cite any scriptures that demonstrate his position. He only cites, like when I'm talking about the 144,000 being obviously symbolic, he says, well, there's this study you need to go through. In other words, I need to go read Watchtower's words about why it's symbolic because he can't point to any scripture that demonstrates what he's saying to be true. The only thing that demonstrates his correctness is Watchtower's printed publications because they made that up and they're saying that it's correct. But you have to read the context. When he <laughs> says that over and you have to read the context, you have to read the context. That's just telling me he doesn't know why. He can't explain it. He can't demonstrate the scriptures. And therefore, uh, I just must not be understanding the context. I get it. He's an elder. He's supposed to know this stuff. He's supposed to understand it. But when I ask him a basic, simple question, he cannot answer it because the Watchtower does not teach Jehovah's Witnesses to understand the Bible. They teach Jehovah's Witnesses to read Watchtower publications and just believe what they say is true, even though the governing body admits it is not inspired and not infallible, which Jimmy will get into with the el other elder in a little bit. But he gets so judgmental with me mm -hmm. when he says, well, you're not of that group. Well, how do you know? I'm not of that group. You read the scripture in Romans, and I didn't even think to say that. He read the scripture in Romans that showed if God spoke to my heart, then I am of that group because Holy Spirit has something to do with it. But now he's casting judgment on me, saying it can't be me. Why can't it be me? Because I'm not, I don't go to the kingdom home. Because they are the only true religion, because anyone other than them is in Babylon the Great from the devil. Something I want to share an experience on with that point mm -hmm. was I did go to an Easter service this past week mm -hmm. in another church. Uh, I went just to go see my granddaughter sing and we were going to leave after she sung, but my wife said, let's sit here for a little bit. So we ended up sitting through this sermon. I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm not going to name the church or anything like that, but my biggest takeaway from what that preacher was saying was the people in that auditorium or in that church were evil people, no matter what they do is not good enough. You've got to listen to what we are saying. So it was the same yeah. message as far as making people feel like crap. Yeah. That 
and it was at another church. It just wasn't Watchtower. So now I've been to churches that are like that. But to be fair, I've also been to churches that are not like that at all. Uh, so there's a big variance, but a lot of fundamentalist churches, uh, like Southern Baptist churches, there's like hard line, hardcore mm -hmm. churches are very similar to Jehovah's Witnesses in that way. And that's because they have, they come, it's actually like Lutheranism. Martin Luther is the one who came up with this idea that people are absolutely completely worthless from birth. And if you ever read any of the stuff he wrote in the 15th century, it's very obvious that's where it comes from. That's not a Jewish perspective at all. When you read the Jewish perspective on Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and all that, it's a very different ideology behind the fall of man and all that. That's very Lutheran. And I think what the government, well, not the government body, but that what that elder was saying to you was basically, you're not living up to Jehovah's manner of approval. As in watchtowers it was manner. straight okay. gaslighting is yeah. what he was doing yeah that's what it was and I think, and go ahead i was gonna say i'm well i i'm sure of that um as as children as adults you're not even allowed to go to a funeral in another church you're not it, as witnesses you know if if a family member got married i I couldn't go to another church. You're not allowed to. And I think that Jehovah's Witnesses are very afraid of that. I don't think it's so much that you can't go. They are afraid of you either finding out that they are exactly the same as every other church. Good point. Or, or, Good point. or finding out, like what you were saying, John, that there are some very loving ones. And I think they're afraid of of their sheep finding this out. And they also don't want you to hear scriptures that contradict the watchtower's take, which you will hear if you go to other church services. When my grandfather died, my father's father, we went to the funeral for like the viewing, but when it, his dad was Catholic, sort of, uh, but when the guys wanted to give the sermon, the, start, the priest started giving the sermon, we went and waited outside which is so disrespectful. It's a horrible thing to do. You don't have to agree with what they say, but sit through the sermon. That was his church. That was his religion. Just listen. When you go to, I've never seen anyone come to a witness funeral and leave for the talk because they don't want to hear the scriptures that are read. It's just so disrespectful to walk out like that, which we did. And then we went to the, the burial part and we sat through all that. It's, the Watchtower's hubris and how high-minded they teach people to be and how superior they teach them to be and how everything else is from Satan, everything else is from the devil, is so antithetical to the behavior of Jesus when you read the Gospels. It's so completely contradictory to his attitude towards people. Now, Jesus was pretty hard lined with the religious leaders, but with regular people, he was not. But Jehovah's yep. Witnesses are taught to be disrespectful to everyone and their mm -hmm. religion because they're, and they're rude. They're really they're rude. 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 Yeah. Didn't the guy say, I couldn't care less what the governing body said? Yes, he did. Did y'all hear yeah, that? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, that's what he says. I couldn't care less what the governing body says. I only care what the Bible says. But he has not quoted a single scripture to date in this video. And he's parroted everything the governing body's put he out. He cited the governing body repeatedly. So who is he getting his understanding from? The Bible or the governing body? Well, he quoted the governing body far more and referenced them far more than the Bible, which he had referenced zero times. So there's that. You intimidated him, John. He he realized that you knew more than he did. And, and I think he just didn't know where to go from there. And I get that. But the part that bothered me the most is he said, we don't shun children. It was all I could do. I'm trying to maintain a reasonable amount of decorum, you know, <laughs> because I have gotten thousands of comments from people mm -hmm. who are being shunned by their parents. Mm -hmm. Some when they were younger, some when they were older, but they are absolutely shunned. They have and no family just, left. Yeah. And he just bold-faced lies and says, no, we don't do that. And he says, you're not keeping up with the chariot. And what he meant by that 
is their new update where minors aren't uh, put into a judicial committee that at first their parents were supposed to deal with it. And I did a video on this the other day. And only if they persist, despite their parents' admonition. In other words, if the parents can't get them in line with what the Watchtower says, then the elders have to come in and do it. But they don't say when they'll do it. It is my opinion that they will wait until the child is no longer a minor under the law and then immediately swoop in and disfellowship him and he's shunned. That's my opinion about how they're going to work that. It's part of what I call their weasel words. A great reference I picked up from Reddit. Actually, it'll be Reddit. They use weasel words. So they say just enough so that everyone in the culture of the witnesses knows what they mean, but that later they can point out and say, oh, we didn't say that. Mm -hmm. That's not what we really said, but everybody knows what they mean. Oh, but they can get in front of a judge, like that uh, clip from the Canadian attorney, and mm -hmm. lie and say, we never say that because there's a technicality in the elder's rule book that doesn't say that. But in the Watchtower that the regular Jehovah's Witnesses, the rank and file read, it absolutely says that. Mm -hmm. So they can lie. It's weasel words. That's what it is. And in, and in the meantime, they can make life hell for that poor child because yes. say the child is 15, 16 years old. They can tell every other youth in the congregation, don't invite them to any of your parties, don't have them at houses. Um, if they can invite the parents over and not invite the kid, that they can have that kid complete, uh, completely ostracized from the rest of the people. He, he may not be shunned, but formally. kids need, yeah, formally, but kids need friends. So then he's going to go out in the world and he's going to find friends. And now they've got even more of a reason to disfellowship them. Exactly. Yep. And when I pushed him on it and he said, oh, we don't do that. I said, oh, so God changed his mind. No. Oh, so it's just a man-made doctrine. No. Oh, so you got it wrong. No. no. Well, it has to be one of those three things. There's no other possible thing it could be. Either God changed his mind, you made it up, or you got it wrong. It's one of those three things, but he says no to all of them. Mm -hmm. And that that's the indoctrination you get with witnesses. Mm -hmm. They can't explain it because it doesn't make sense, especially from a scriptural position. You can't back up that kind of reasoning with scripture. You, But you're indoctrinated to believe that whatever they tell you is true. And so you just deny, deny, deny. Anybody got anything else before we get on to Jimmy? I think the only other thing was the, the tie and... <laughs> being able to go on stage and everything. Only thing I wrote down was, is they have a look to protect. Yeah. And they just want to, you know, show a display of one's means of life. That's the only thing I could think of. You know, you got, you got to have a tie to be on stage because that's the way we want yeah. it to be. It has nothing to do with God's word. Nothing. It's just them. He will never admit. And he never admits that it, they just made up this rule. The community doesn't care if you wear a tie. He admitted um, that about when he lived in uh, Hawaii. The community didn't look at a tie as being something that people needed to wear. Politicians didn't wear them. Other church pre preachers didn't wear them. So why did you have to? If the community didn't have a problem with it, why did the brother, like he said, have to put on a clip-on tie to give uh, to be what preside over field service? Why? The only answer to that question is because some guy made up a rule that you have to follow, but he just will not admit to that. I think it also sets himself on a, on a pedestal a little bit. And the only reason I say that is because when I was selling insurance back door to door years ago in the 90s, I was out in the country mm -hmm. and I had just started with the company and I was wearing a tie. Mm -hmm. I go into this guy's yard he's got a lot of farmland and he comes off the tractor and i tell him hey i'm jimmy bell blah 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 he's like sir i ain't talking to you until you take that tie off <laughs> now the question is is why did he say i'm not going to talk to you until you take that tie off there was a reasoning he had i can't answer that you guys can assume for yeah. yourselves but i did i took the tie off and end up selling him a policy. Yeah. But he said he wasn't going to talk to me if I had that tie on. I could guess at it, that it has to do with if you're all dressed up like that, you think you're better than somebody. That's where That's I was what going my guess with. would have been. That's where I was yeah. going with this connection to Watchtower. 
you know, they have to put their ties on so yeah. they look good, protecting their absolutely protecting their image. I get it. I get it. Well, let us know what you think in the comments. I'm sure you're already typing down there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but let's go to the last clip where Jimmy speaks to an elder, a different one, <laughs> who's way nicer and less judgmental. And though he contradicts himself a lot. And yes. a young guy who is recently reinstated after being disfellowshipped. Last clip. I got a question. John brought this up to me, and I figured, well, let me ask somebody that might know. Sure. Here's a watchtower from February 2017. And in the article, Who's Leading God's People Today? Let me come on this side, it's better. Yeah. It uh, says, The governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. Therefore, it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. Right. So the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. Now, when I was younger, I was under the assumption when I was in the Watchtower then that the governing body was inspired, that they pray for Holy Spirit, and that they're inspired by God to make decisions for the organization? No, only the Word of God is inspired. But the Holy Spirit can guide us. All right, so yeah. so therefore it can err in doctrinal matters. Yeah, and that's why doctrine has changed over the years. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I guess some of it. I guess. I guess I'm kind of confused because, like in the in the uh, Watchtower update number two that Sanderson just did, mm -hmm. when he was at the end of that video, they were talking about the change in the pants and the beards and all that. Or in the pants, but they never gave a scripture to back that up why that change was made. I was just kind of curious. I didn't know whether they might be, uh, you know, well, the, organization. Well, the change was made because the Bible doesn't say don't do it. So they're trying to come close to what the Bible says to do and what the Bible says not to do. Okay. All yeah. right. So the Bible is never instructed us don't grow a beard. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, the Bible never did say right. you can't have a but beard. But all along, see, either way is good because grow a beard, don't grow a beard. Either way is good because we always used to follow the example of the, the, the brothers around us. When you come to the assembly, hardly anyone had a beard but an interesting person. Right, right. But so, the light gets brighter gradually, so, so there'll I, be changes. I wonder if there's going to be changes into the shunning. The shunning of the disfellowshipped ones, or even those that aren't even well, disfellowshipped. Well, we've never used the word shunning in, in a long, long time. But, uh, no, there's still disfellowship, because that was that was an arrangement in the early Christian congregation. So they never used the word shunning? No, no, I'm saying we, we haven't used that in a long time. Oh, you haven't used that word in a long yeah, time. Yeah, because it has a negative, in, in, uh, uh, a negative uh, thought to it. Right, right. And besides, we were never told to be unfriendly, but some friends would accidentally, and that's under the category of imperfection. There will always be some that go too far, too lenient, or too too strict, but you just have to follow the guidance you're given. Because it's God's organization, it's not ours. So, so, so we can't choose to go on, on opinions. Okay. You know, when it comes to things. So, Jehovah's Witnesses, so do they shun, or uh, I hate to use that word, but you ain't used it in a long time. So, do they or don't they shun? Well, we don't use the word shun. What, what but is the it practice of shun? not talking to somebody. Oh, right. You right. know, because not, even it's says that to be no fellowship. It's all based on Bible principles. But isn't that only in the spiritual sense? Not Shouldn't family relations continue to say? No, no, family. We've explained in great detail uh, over the years that the family relation remains, but the spiritual relationship ends. Really? Yeah, the family relationship remains. Are you an elder? Yes. How long have you been an elder? Many years. Okay, so, so I just had an elder tell me that the family relation should stay the same, just not spiritual act, spiritual association. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And you're thinking of your family. I am. Of them misapplying, yeah. Because sometimes people don't keep up with reading things. And I remember you telling me that earlier. Yeah. Like, if you're... 
You're a baptized brother, correct? You were I, baptized. I was. I was baptized. Yeah. I've never been disfellowshipped. Well, I was back in the '90s, but I got reinstated. But you're inactive. <laughs> but I'm inactive. Yeah. Okay. Now, are you of the anointed? I thought we weren't supposed to ask anybody that question. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> you're right. Hey, you're keeping up with your reading. <laughs> um, I, let's just say I follow the example that Jesus set in the Bible that in Matthew 26, 26 and 27, where he said, "Take, eat." Take drink. Right. That's I how, apologize for the question. That's how I'll answer that. Right. But when we when we're part of the kings and priests to be, you know, the yeah. new covenant. Right. When we're a member of that and we know for sure we don't live on earth. Yeah. Right. But I won't get into that. You've read that. And there's new information about that as well. But um, the uh, with your family, there's always people, even in Israel, that would misapply Bible principles. Okay. So all you have to do is locate them and read them to your family. Okay. But should you, because you're inactive, treat you any differently? The Bible doesn't say we should. Now, somebody that's an apostate, they would treat them the same way they would a disfellowship person, correct? Correct. Even if they weren't disfellowship, but they declare themselves they want to disassociate from us, or they start to expound this apostate teachings. Right, you pull away from such a person. That's an example. They don't have to be. They don't have to be disfellowship because they might pull away. My brother-in-law pulled away before he could be disfellowship, and he's gotcha. a, as much of an apostate as anybody. I'm only asking these questions because it's been a long time since sure. I've been. Sure. But uh, what would what would constitute an apostate teaching? What is well, an example? What is an example of an apostate well, teaching? If you start if you start celebrating uh, birthdays, if you start celebrating Christmas, that's part of Christendom is apostate. Okay. Because they're opposed to the Christ by what they do. They don't have to say they're opposed to it, what they do. So there are many apostates. If you, if you dabble in the occult, or if you talk against true Bible teachings, you disagree with them, and then you start to teach otherwise what the Bible says. So if you disagree with something that Watchtower says... No, if you disagree with the Bible. Because the Watchtower is, infa is not infallible. Okay, or so inspired only the word of God is the Bible. So you can disagree with the watchtower is so you could disagree with like changes and stuff like that. Yeah, you do and that's respectfully though, you don't Yeah, 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 I get that. My opinion is better than that of the watchtower's thoughts because you'll notice how many scriptures are in the watchtower. Everything almost right. every sentence is backed up by a scripture principle. Right. Yeah, so it can be questions, there's no problem. So you could question the watchtower and, and disagree with them and you wouldn't be labeled an apostle state because you're not going against the Bible. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But you wouldn't, see you're entitled to do that, but you have to be careful that you're not disagreeing disagree with Bible principles or Bible teachers. Because it's a, I've never had anybody say that to me before yeah. because I always heard that if you spoke out against Watchtower itself as an organization Well, you don't want your to speak against Jehovah's organization. That's disrespectful. Okay. Yeah, you, you definitely would not um, you definitely would not speak. But just being disrespectful, would, would that label someone as an apostate? No, you're just disrespectful. That okay. could be a disorderly one. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, I, and those, we noticed over the years that such ones would pull away. They would stop coming to the meetings because they, they disagree. You know, if they don't gotcha. agree with the truth, that's up to them. But does the watchtower print the truth? Yes, it does. But when what happens sometimes is we, um, I was just watching the children, they, they were on the platform. They always they run, wanted to they're always running wine, around. Because wine stains big time. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, they're just okay. out quick. Um, but um, the, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, just, so you have to watch that you never, if you disagree with the truth or Bible teaching, and it's called the way or the truth, as you know, uh, why would you want to be part of Jehovah's organization? You can go to another organization. But you know what I mean? Those who see the truth and recognize it and live by it will stay, uh, stay with us, you know. Even as Jesus, they said, uh, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and then the disciples who believed previous to that went away. But with your family, you know, even, let's take another example. We can walk and talk. I gotta grab my bag. See if you, you were in my
say we were brothers, right? And you were this fellowship, but you were living in the house. You weren't an older one that like could be married, had a full time job, and didn't need to live with me. But say we were younger, you would live with me. Would I have? Uh, would I um, have contact? Yes, necessary family business. Right. You know, like if my father got sick, I would say, Tim, we got to go see dad. We go together, you know, to see our dad. Uh, we need to take care. We need to discuss this. Is he going to go to a nursing home? Or we got to bring him into the house, you know, so there's certain necessary things. We wouldn't pray and study together, but we might have a meal together. Right, right. Yeah, because you're part of the family. You never don't become, you know what I mean? Even as an inactive person, you don't become, you don't all of a sudden become no part of the family. I you agree know, with that. Uh, or shun, like you said. I, I don't. Yeah, as my son left for five years. He was in fellowship. Yeah. And uh, we didn't give dirty looks or say anything stupid or negative. You know what I mean? Right, right. And he was in fellowship. Right. Because wow. Because you have to treat people with respect and dignity. You know, it's the spiritual part of it. You know, you know, you know one thing that concerned me that I thought was kind of fun, well, I won't say it was funny. I thought it was just kind of shocking. Yeah. And I don't know if this is the right place to say it or not, but I've, like I said, I've been away for a while. But I have seen reports on the news and in newspapers about former elders being convicted and for facing time. They're always, I, I see, you say I what see. you want, there's going to be more of that as time goes on. False reports, and some may be blown out of proportion, they may be accurate, they may be true, but you have to say to yourself, many of them might not be true. I, well, yeah. And you know what happens, I, it's just, we turn that person right over to the authorities and we tell the family right away, you, I can't tell you to report it, but you really should give serious thought to does, reporting Does the headquarters have anything that they say to the elders about how to handle that situation? Well, the, the, what, the, what the family does is, number one, the family should turn turn the report over to the authorities. Right. Because it was their child. Right. And if we become aware of it, yeah, there's, there's been articles on that. There's been information hmm. that we need to really make sure you protect your child. And if I'm a witness of something, I'm, you know, it's kind of my attention, it might some, be some truth. I tell you. But if a child came to me, you've got to take with a grain of salt, but you always got to think to yourself, it could be true. Yeah. yeah, I've. So I've, if it was your child, I would encourage you. I'll put, I'll put, I'll put it this way: if somebody messes with my child, uh, that, we're not going to need no authorities. Oh mercy, yeah. We're not going to yeah. need no authorities. I'll be taking care of that my dang on self. Um, I know what you mean, John. Uh, Tim, I'm cool. <laughs> All right, appreciate it, man. Good. How are you? I'm Jimmy Bell. Uh, what's your name? Jimmy Bell. Jimmy Bell. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. Doing all right? Yeah. Very good. Y'all coming in or going out? We're just coming to say hi to our friend Mark. Mark Tell me to get you. Oh, I'm waiting on John. Okay, right. On. Very cool. What do you think of the program? Um, yeah, I'm visiting. Okay. Yeah, I'm visiting. I'm down here on business, visiting my buddy. Okay. Um, huh? You look sharp. Thank you. I went, I went old school. Yeah. Except for the beard. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the beers are in right now. Where, where are you from normally? Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Waynesboro, Virginia. Okay. And so yeah, that's where that's where I spent most of my time pioneering and got accepted to Bethel back in the '90s. I never got to go to Bethel. Just didn't work out. Just didn't work out. This things happen. So, but it's okay. It's okay. So it's been it's been quite a journey. I've been inactive for about five years. Okay. Last meeting I was at was January of 2019. I literally just got reinstated. Did you? Oh, if you don't mind me asking, how long were you uh, this fellowship for? About three years. About three years. Mm -hmm. I got this fellowship in '94. '94. Got reinstated back in '97. Okay. That's when I was born. Huh? That's when I was born. '97. '97. Oh my God! You're such a baby. I just turned 50 last wow. year. That's wisdom. 50. That's okay. 50. That's beauty and wisdom. Do I look wisdom? like I should be 50 years old? No. Not a day older than 49. I'm gonna tell you what. I'm gonna leave you my card. Okay. There's a reason why I'm leaving my card. Yes, sir. I want you to look at my name on YouTube. Okay. Oh, and then, well, I was gonna put that in there. I'll look you up, Jimmy Bell. Yeah. I wouldn't forget your name anyway. Let's look me up on YouTube. And uh, what sort of information you put out on YouTube? You'll find out. Mysterious. Me and John both. Okay. And the only reason I do, the only reason I'm giving you the card mm -hmm. is because uh, you're pretty cool. You seem like you got a level head on yourself. 
and uh, I just want to talk to him. Okay. You know, you'll you'll kind of see. Is there anything anti Jehovah's Witness? Uh, I went, eh, maybe a little bit. Okay. But we do it. In, but there's a different way of healing. Respectfully. Respectfully. Res re no, listen. Respectfully, Respectfully. I'm not going to look you up on YouTube. Okay, that's fine. And here's why. That's fine. I was out in the world, and even before I was out in the world, I've never been a black and white person. Right. I've never been somebody who found it easy to dedicate himself to Jehovah. Okay. And just fell in with it. Even though I was raised with it, and psychologically, if you're raised in something. Yeah, I was raised. You know, it's it's very likely that that's going to be a part of it, you know. Yeah. I've looked into politics. Uh -huh. I've studied it deeply. I've, I've, studied, too. I've studied science deeply. I've asked questions. How you doing, John? Hey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I overheard your conversation slightly. I want you to know I've never shown you. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> but I've looked into I science. That. Absolutely. I Absolutely. That. I was disfellowship for quite a while. You know, I just got reinstated. I've looked into science and I've thought about the plight of humanity for the past thousands of years, whether Jehovah's Witnesses have it right that it's been 6,000 years, right. or whether archaeologists ar archaeologists have it right that it's 10 to 12,000 years, or if the people who believe in other things are right that it's 50,000 years. Right, whatever right. the case, whatever the case, the plight of humanity for since it's been around has been that there's a cycle of violence that continues on and on and on. I gotta get out of here. Oh, we gotta get going. Do you wanna walk outside and talk? Yeah, we, yeah, let's go. And last thing I'll say is, reasonably, you could say that the only way that things could ever get better, that there could be no more war, no more suffering, the only way that those things could ever end, uh -huh. take, take Jehovah's Witnesses out of it, take religion out of it. Okay, oh yeah, okay. The only way it could ever end is if every human being on earth chose to work together. I agree with life. that. It's the only way I, I could ever work. I agree with that. And so I thought to myself for a long time while I was out, I thought about different groups that are out there that do things. I thought about their motivations. Yeah. And being one of Joe's witnesses at one point, you know that Jehovah's Witnesses do not make money. Right. They are getting wealthy from being one of Joe's witnesses. And so the thing that I came to, at least not the elders and ministerial service. And it is possible that this is just a big pyramid scheme. It is possible. I, I like yeah. to consider every possibility. Okay. That's why I want to have and a conversation so, with so, 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 listen. And, and, and not this, changing this is you. My, this is my observation in life. Yeah. The only people that I've met, and I have lived in South America, mm -hmm. I've lived in Europe, and I've lived all over the United States for my work. Okay. okay? The thing I've observed is the only group of people on Earth today who are actually practicing love and trying to pursue it. Not there's individual people. You and John are probably beautiful people. There's individuals. We like to think we are. <laughs> individuals who have great love. Yes. Okay. But as far as a group of people that are putting love first as their central theme, it's Jehovah's Witnesses, man. I get what you're saying. That's what I believe. And so, like I said in the beginning, I don't know. I guess but I believe. I guess the only thing that I have a problem with on that is being shunned when you're not this fellowship. My mom's doing it to me right now. My mom's my mom's been my mom could be a governing body member if they let sisters be a governing body yeah. member. She's uh she's been in a long time. And she's shunning me when I'm not. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, and so I don't look at that as being love. I think that's unconditional love. I and so I don't like that. Yeah, and so. people make mistakes. But I am open to talk with people with respect. I'm not trying to change anybody's views or anything like that. Um, hey, hey. But you seem pretty cool. I'd love to have you further our conversation. Jimmy Bell, great to meet you. Good take to meet care, you, buddy. buddy. Y'all yep. take care. Have a great night. Well, that was a fun conversation that I had with that elder. Uh, no contradictions at all, were there? <laughs> well, at least yours was nicer than mine. Yes, mine was nicer. He didn't judge you. No. And, and, and see, now, here... My style is a little bit different than John's style. We were going to touch on this yeah. um, because there's, there's there's so many XJWs out there. They all have different styles of doing things, getting their message across, doing their activism. Mine's more of a wounded sheep type person, and I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm not going to, you know, unless it's a car crash, I'm feel, really feeling it that day. <laughs> all right. But in this situation, John did a video saying that we wanted to be respectful and polite so that if ever down the road, anyone that we interacted with um, runs across an apostate, they wouldn't mm -hmm. have a bad taste in their mouth. Now, I know my elder, my elder, if when he finds out that I'm an apostate, 
He's gonna be like, "That's the nicest apostate I've ever talked to." <laughs> I don't think my elder. Your, what's your elder gonna say? What's your elder gonna think, John? I don't know. I, but I should I tell him what you texted me? <laughs> I don't remember what I said. What did I text you? You, used to, you texted me. That elder's gonna think I knew that mf'er was up to something. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably what he was gonna think. But it also, to be fair, uh, you're just your personality is i mean let me just tell them myself you're way more agreeable just generally speaking yeah you were like you're, you're the kind of person who brings people together you're just a way more agreeable person than me i'm not a jerk i'm just very very direct it's right it's my personality and i i've <laughs> always said i think it stems from the fact that that's why i was in software for 25 years because i think in very like precise ways right and so i'm not good at Couching stuff. <laughs> See, I'm like, not good. And in your case, I think that works really, really well with what you're trying to do because it helps people to keep talking and they don't get as defensive. He definitely got way more defensive with me. And I, I take the blame for that because I was saying, well, what about this? What about this? What right. about this? And he couldn't answer. Whereas you just let him keep I just talking. Let him keep talking. You gave him the rope to hang himself. Exactly. Really that's weird. what I did with yeah. the other ones we talked yeah. to, the, the CEO and everything. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I did it. Um, so this time I, I, one of the things I did have in my book bag was the February, 2017 issue of the watchtower, where it does say, um, that the watchtower is not, the governing body is not inspired and not infallible and that they can err in doctrine. I literally showed that to him, pulled it out. He was probably like, wow, where did he get this thing from? But, uh, he was like, yeah, yeah, they're not in. They're not infallible, and we can err in doctrine. Hey, but you but, can't disagree. Like you can't say, "Oh, well, since you're in, not infallible and you're not inspired, I don't think you're correct about this." So I'm going to believe something different and tell other people what I think. If you do that under Watchtower law in the Shepherd the Flock of God book, you are an apostate. Correct. So they may claim they're not inspired and not infallible, but you better act like they are in your response to the things that they say, or you will be kicked out and shunned. And yes, they shun. They do. Shun. But later, it doesn't matter what word they use, they shun. But later in the conversation, he says, uh, Watchtower, uh, Watchtower, or does Watchtower print the truth? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's saying, because we have scriptures inside the Watchtower. They, I'm sorry, they're equating Watchtower to the Bible. Yeah, that's what he did. And then he goes and says, you know, only the Word of God is inspired, but the Holy Spirit can guide us. It's what? very circular logic. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's circular. <laughs> I love when you ask him, what would you have to do to be an apostate? And he basically lists off all these things that mean Birthdays. not being a witness makes you an apostate you can't celebrate anything you can't teach anything that's not true in the bible but their their teachings have changed hundreds of times so what he means is you can't teach anything that's not taught by the watchtower because the bible clearly hasn't changed but the watchtower teachings have changed repeatedly so if you cannot teach anything against the bible truths what he means is against what the watchtower says it means which means anyone who disagrees with the watchtower goes to another church celebrates anything else they're all apostates all of them under his uh yeah the, what he said it would take to be an apostate and when we're talking about beards at the beginning of the conversation he says the bible says don't doesn't say don't do it okay <laughs> well the bible also says or doesn't say you can't do birthdays. Yeah, it doesn't say that. Yeah, but Watchtower does. Yeah, there's a lot of things that the or Bible Mother's Day or Father's Day or it, there's so it, many it things does. that it doesn't say. But they arbitrarily let everyone that follows them know, hey, y'all aren't doing birthdays, y'all aren't doing Mother's Day, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, you're not having a beard before the new light hit. <laughs> yeah. But none of yeah. that is backed in scripture none at all. It. None of it is. Yeah. 
And then he says, Jimmy asks him, oh, so I can disagree <laughs> with the Watchtower. And it's like, oh, yeah, of course you can. But then he says, but you don't want to speak against the organization. But in under Watchtower law, and I call it that because the Shepherd of the Flock of God book is 290 pages, yep. 70,000 words of law that is enforced by the elders down onto the congregation. Under their law, disagreeing, speaking out against the organization if you disagree with them, that is exactly what you're doing. You're an apostate. We're going to kick you out and shun you. So he says you can disagree, but then he says you can't. But well, Watchtower can't. is their religion. Well, I mean, they, right. they, that, they, 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 like I said, at our memorial here, not one Bible. You know, it, it, everything goes by the watchtower. I, I mean, I remember growing up, you'd ask a question, well, oh, go look in this bound volume or go look there, go yeah. look such and such. But it was never pull out the Bible. And I mean, sure, a little piece like this of the Bible, but never in context. No, Watchtower uh, engages in what's called eisegesis. For those who watch my videos, you've heard me talk about this before, where they put all of their own ideas and opinions onto the text. So the Watchtower is the law. When the Watchtower prints, this is what this scripture means. You cannot question that, not openly anyway. If you ha if you do question it openly, the elders are going to pull you to the back. Yep, and they're going to talk to you. And they're going to tell you that you can think that some might even go so far as to say, because I've had people say this to me, you can think that, but you can't talk about that to other people yep. because that makes you an apostate. So it's not okay to have an opinion that disagrees with the watchtower, which as you said, Laurel, means the watchtower is their religion. And like Jimmy said, it is equated with the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. No. So now let's go into the, where he asked me the question, he must have saw me take, well, he must have saw me partake because he did ask, <laughs> are you one of the anointed? I loved your response. Oh, I loved your answer, though. That was great. I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> You're not supposed to ask me that question. <laughs> oh, he backtracked on that quick. Yeah, he did. And then even he like did. 15 seconds, I apologize for asking that question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah, that was. Funny. Um, And then we go into the shunning part. And he is saying, okay, so we just talked about this while mm -hmm. we were looking over everything. We don't use the word shunning is what he says, because it derives a negative connotation. Yeah, yeah, it has a, a negative It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. To oh, but the word. fellowshipping is better? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but here's the thing. When you look at the conversation I had with the young kid, and what did he say to John? He said, John, I'll never shun you. Yeah. The guy <laughs> that was recently reinstated <laughs> is using the word shun. And the elder yeah. saying, we don't use the word shun. Yeah. But yet he admits, oh. he admits that that is what they're doing because they can't talk to you. But then he says that they can, and he even goes so far as to say that his fellowship family, you can still have a meal with them. But that is absolutely not what the Watchtower says at all. And I was talking to uh, Jimmy about this before we started recording again. That just goes to show you the young guy who was reinstated, who states a bunch of things that are not Watchtower opinion, and what each of the elders saying, and they contradict each other in the way one is judgmental and the other is not. It just shows you that the Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses are not as cohesive as the no. Watchtower would have you believe they are. Yeah, they're not as, as united. It's hard to be cohesive when things change so rapidly and there's mountains of Watchtower pages you would have to memorize to know exactly what they teach. It's hard to be completely cohesive. No one can remember all the odd little things that the Watchtower teaches about everything and how often it changed. Just in my time being out on the channel and coming back just like three years, I had to catch up on a lot of stuff yeah. that changed in the religion because I wasn't following along anymore with it. So it's impossible for everyone to always be on the same page, but to listen to the Watchtower, oh, we're united in worship of the only true God. No, you're really not. Like, listen to this elder versus that elder versus this newly reinstated guy. They're not saying the same things. 
I want to mention, oh, sorry. I just want to mention one thing about Jimmy's, um, that you talking to that young guy that got reinstated. Yeah. Yeah. You might not have noticed it, but it was the same. It was the same experience that I had at the memorial here. Obviously, I wasn't trusted when I walked in. And um, I told you guys before it started, I took one, I took that great big 1984 Bible. It's the only one I have. I took that and my my um, my uh, tablet while partaking. I was going to take a picture of myself. Well, I call him the guard. This guy was right here. His shoulder was touching my shoulder, and he was watching everything I did. And Jimmy, I noticed the same thing when you were talking to that young guy. He was standing right in the background making sure that you weren't going to say the wrong thing to, to that young guy. Oh, yeah, he the was other guard- guy standing up to the back. He was, gu- he was guarding. He was protecting that young guy from you. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. that was actually his dad. Yeah. Because when we walked out. Oh, it was his dad. Yeah, I, I think that was his yeah. dad. Maybe it was his dad. Was he an elder too, though? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Don't know. Yeah. But when we were outside in the front, that guy was actually motioning him to come on. So... So, they had oh, so he he didn't want he didn't like him talking to you. Yeah, I could tell by the the look on his face has the same look as that guy that was watching everything I did. I get it's that. like we, okay. I just got my son back in. Yeah, <laughs> pull him Don't back out. <laughs> and here I am saying, "Hey, go look at Jimmy Bell on YouTube." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I get you. But it's my card. Go look me up. Go <laughs> yeah. check it out. And hopefully, he will. Yeah. Uh, another thing that the elder was talking about that he said he says about the shunning part. He says Watchtower has explained in great detail over the years that family relations should stay the same. Mm. He said that, right? Yes, he did. Yes, did, did, he did. Did I hear him wrong? Okay, so then he said that, you know, oh, it's some of our friends misunderstood or they take it too far. Didn't they do that with the 1975 I was stuff? thinking the same thing where they made that video. Some of the brothers and sisters were so, living for a date. No, that's exactly what Nathan Norse said on stage in front of everybody. I played that clip yeah. for my 12-year-old uh, daughter and I asked her. Yeah. Uh, Does it sound like he's saying the end will come in 1975? She said, yeah, that's exactly what he's saying. But they deny it. Stay alive till 75. Yeah, gaslighting. So like with your elder, when you asked him, well, was it, what, did y'all make it up? What was the three things? Oh, yeah, I got it. What was the three things? Did God change his mind? Okay. No. No. Was it a man-made doctrine? No. No. Well, then you got it wrong. No. No. But it had to be one of those three things. I forgot. I just lost my train of thought real quick, but it just shows the contradiction. Yeah, they they, oh, they will not accept responsibility for anything <laughs> that they said. Never. They want to either just say no, 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 or you're not reading in context. You're not reading the proper context. Take or study. Or yeah, believe our indoctrination. <laughs> or it's the congregation's fault. It's yeah. it's the people's fault. Mm-hmm. Never yeah. our fault. That's an excellent point. Oh, That's an excellent point. Jesus. Now the next part. Oh, that was infuriating. Not because I thought the guy was being awful. He seemed, he was being very pleasant. But when he starts talking about CSA, he says, you have to take what a kid says with a grain of salt. Uh, In other words, don't immediately believe a child when they tell you that they've been harmed. That is awful. And then he puts off all responsibility from the elders onto the family and to the parents they have to do it they have to do it they have to do it but here's the problem what if the parent is the abuser Mm -hmm. and what if they do the same thing to the spouse if there's a spouse involved yep Uh and everyone's afraid to go to the police obviously the elder has a moral ethical responsibility to report but they will not do it according to this elder it's the parent's job, the parent's job, the parent's job. And that's just awful. Uh, he also did say when I mentioned about, hey, I've been hearing reports, news articles and stuff like that about the situation. Oh, well, you got to be careful because those reports could be 
you know, false or misleading or whatever. So again, not taking responsibility, blaming it on fake reporting and all that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do have this. I can read this real quick yeah, for those sure. that might be interested. Um, from the Shepherd of the Flock, the revised version. This is page 113, I think. Let me see. Yeah, page 112. Uh, chapter 14, Legal Considerations, to ensure that elders comply with CSA reporting laws, two elders should immediately call the legal department for legal advice when the elders learn of an accusation of blank. A call should be made even when both persons involved are minors. The elders should not ask an alleged victim, the accused person, or anyone else to call the legal department on the elder's behalf. The elder should call the legal department even if uh, the following situations occur. And there's a list of like eight or nine different things. Uh, so their job is not to call the authorities right yeah. away. You don't yeah. report. Fork tongue. Yeah. Yeah. So Unless the local law demands that they report they will not do it. So you have to call the watchtower and find out whether or not it's required of you to report. And if the answer is no, and this is what the elder said, it's on the parents, it's on the parents, it's on the parents. Again, blame. I, I've, been, I've been through it. I was with CSA with my my daughter. And uh, that- Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, after four years of the BF that we were getting from the elders, from- and my husband was still in. I was out, but, you know, trying to. Anyways, long story short, um, I took it into my own hands, laid charges. There was a big court case, did the whole thing. And to this day, I mean, it didn't start right away. I got soft shunned at first. Mm -hmm. But now I am the one, and so is my daughter, that are totally shunned from everybody in the family. And yet they talk to her abuser, who I believe now is either a ministerial servant or a, an elder. Wow. Well, that's not wow. uh, following the guidelines <laughs> of what that elder said to me about wanting to treat people with respect and, and dignity. dignity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't do it. No, they don't. No, they do not. They do not. So uh, I guess the last thing on the kid part was uh, where he did say, uh, he is open-minded, yeah. so hopefully he is open-minded and gives us some research, because I don't know if Watchtower is a pyramid scheme or not. <laughs> I, that. I mean, that's what he said. Um, let's have a conversation there, buddy. Let's talk. Yeah. Um, and then he said that out of his experience, only JWs are showing love and pursuing it in the world. That Which was means he's never been to any other he doesn't church yeah also. he hasn't tried anything else he he's anything. he's just trying been he what do you say three years out i bet for yeah. three years he's been trying to get back in now in his defense i can say that when i was fully in i probably would have said the same yeah. thing yeah. i probably know why i've said the same thing out in field service well jw's you know, we show love and we do this and that yeah. so that just just goes to show that that indoctrination does run deep I want to throw out one contrast because I know this kid has never been anywhere else. I shouldn't call him. He's old enough. He's 26. Yeah, you know, he's This young guy uh, is has not been anywhere else or done anything else or gone to any food banks or any community service centers or uh, he hasn't volunteered for Love Incorporated. He hasn't worked for Habitat for Humanity. He's never done any of these things where people show enormous amounts of love yep. and care and giving. And I went to a church in Charlotte, it was a progressive Christian church, and they had, it wasn't a, a wealthy church, they didn't have a lot of money, it was a fair sized campus, but not huge, and they had a building that was built specifically to house homeless people when the weather was bad, or if they were sick, or if something like that was happening, and people from the congregation would volunteer to keep watch at night and take care of them and give them what they needed. And they would clean up after them and clean the sheets and they would, they could shower and, you know, wash their clothes and all that stuff. And this church volunteered all over the community for underprivileged children, for food banks, you name it. They made clothes for people. 
And when I saw that, that was the last church I went to, like, for a continuous period of time. Nothing made me realize more than that, that the Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses are nothing like what Jesus said yeah. to nope. be in the gospel. The only thing they do is preach. But Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, helped the poor. They carried a money box specifically to give money to the poor. Watchtower does none of that. It has nope. no charitable arm. It doesn't even help its own, much less people outside. So anyone who thinks that the witnesses are the only people showing love has been thoroughly brainwashed and has not experienced any other kind of charitable organization at all. And that's all I have to say about that. You're totally right there. Yeah. Um, actually, this was about four years ago now. We had a, uh, or maybe three, we had a quite a nasty hurricane down here in Puerto Vallarta. I work, I, I volunteer. I do a lot of volunteer work, helping feed the poor people and so on. And I know, I knew the guys that were in charge of that part of it, of looking after Puerto Vallarta, because I'm not really in Puerto Vallarta, but I wanted to go over and help. And I knew them well enough that I could ask them questions. They know where my background was. And I, I said to them, have any Jehovah's Witnesses come to help at all? Not one. I, I went around and I asked, is, is anybody here one of Jehovah's Witnesses and they need help? And I didn't get, but there was a church that came in that set up a tent they had volunteers coming day and night, bringing coffee, bringing sweets, bringing casseroles. Bringing, they were making sure everybody was fed. And then the rest of the community was out cleaning up, helping build the houses and whatever. But yet Watchtower had the nerve to go and say that they were down helping with the hurricane. So I don't believe a word they say about anything. All goes back to creating an image for themselves. Yeah, it's an image. That, yeah, there's just an, an image. Well, final thoughts? Yeah, well, my final thoughts are I'm really glad we went. I'm yeah. really glad we got lucky, or maybe it wasn't luck, that we I, talked to the people to that we elders. talked to, <laughs> to the right elders, the one who was speaking and the one that Jimmy uh, had to say. And I'm really glad that you spoke to that younger guy, too, because I think that perspective, people need to see how different the opinions are across the board. And that was good that we had yeah. that, too. So I'm really glad we did it. Uh, I'm glad I kept my cool <laughs> with that guy <laughs> and but i would love to know what you guys think uh so be sure to leave comments below and what do you guys we had backup for bail money though if something was going to happen there was that was set up that was set in place anyway laura what was your final thoughts on your experience and what we did to, what we did oh my my experience was it really hasn't changed much other than the fact that, I mean, the talk is the same. I, I understand enough Spanish and even the, even the sign up top is talking about the memorial of his death, not, not nothing about life and resurrection. And the fact that I had that guy, it was like, I call him my guard. I, I, I mean, I couldn't take a picture. I couldn't, I, nothing. And, and, oh, I forgot to tell you. That when I did partake, yeah. the guy that after he got the the uh, bread back from me, there's some guy in the back, I guess, that was keeping track. And he goes like this and he points to me and one, one, we got one. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So I got counted. <laughs> you got counted. All right. Wow, you got. So, oh, so going back to that, because I, I don't think we've talked about that. So, at, so. Do you know if you were the only one at your place that did it? Did you see anybody else? Nobody. I think I was the only one. Okay. Mm. So at ours. Oh, yeah. I, you know, so we partook. Mm. We saw the elder that John talked to, the mm. guy that gave the talk. Yeah, he did. He partook. The Where I was sitting, I couldn't turn around and look, but you could. So you I saw a lot more people partaking than I expected. And it reminded me, I saw a JW Thoughts video on it. He's really good. And he's funny. Uh but he made a prediction. He says there's so many people that are partaking now. The number goes up every year. It's getting ridiculous. And so he's like, here's my hot take prediction that in two oh, years, yeah. 
Uh, they're going to stop. I forget exactly what he says. They're going to either stop counting or they're going to like downplay how important that is and downplay the 144,000 thing, maybe finally accepting that it's symbolic. And that's very interesting a uh, take. I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to change something. But at this point, with all the other stuff, I thought they would never change that they have. Who knows? Yeah. It, it could Stay happen. tuned. Who yeah, knows? Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> they might just become another this. Christian religion, you know, just that's to get people coming in. That's yeah. what I keep saying. They're liberalizing. They're liberalizing. They're liberalizing because they're losing money. They need to hang on to people. They need to attract younger people because it's such an old religion now. And they need people to take over as the managers, the elders of the business, because mm -hmm. it is a business. And they can't do that if they keep things the way it is now. Yeah. But we would all love to know what you think. So be sure to leave your comments below. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. And as always, thanks for watching. See you guys later. Thanks, everyone.